Good afternoon and welcome back. I hope everyone enjoyed the lunch break. Again, we're so happy to have each of you joining us today, whether you're in person or online. This afternoon, Dr. Nash will join us again to share from his work with combat and occupational stress injuries, focusing on prevention and healing. For those joining us online, during Dr. Nash's presentation, please submit your questions using the Q&A function on your Zoom toolbar. Please join me again in welcoming Dr. Nash to our stage. Back, am I turned on? Yeah. Uh, don't have the slides on the screen here. They're on this thing. There we go, thank you. Okay, so one uh, thing I wanna mention after this morning's uh, keynote, we, I would love to share my slides with anyone that wants them. You can either uh, talk to Brent and the people who organize this or shoot me an email. And you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna fast forward to my last slide which has the email on there. William.nash at opstress.net. Shoot me an email if you have any questions, comments, or if you want slides, I'm happy to share. Now that you've seen the talk, we can all take questions. <laughs> all right. So this is also going to be shorter than this morning, which I, I know I packed way too much in there, but I wanted to give you the whole picture. Because to me, that's everything to being able to figure out, okay, now what do we do about it? And that's what we're going to talk about now. So this afternoon, we're going to develop some systems-based interventions for prevention, treatment, mitigation of stress, injuries, and illnesses. Now, if you're thinking, why should I give a care about prevention? All I care about is treatment. All I care about is recovering myself, or how do I treat my clients? I hope to convince you in this next 45 minutes or so that this is a package. And just like physical health disorders, you gotta know how to prevent yourself from getting heart disease just as well as you need to know what to do about it if you get heart disease. You know how to prevent diabetes as well as what to do when you get a high blood sugar. Prevention, mitigation has to be like safety. It's everybody's job every day. So what we're gonna do this afternoon, I'm gonna share, I'm gonna teach you some tools for assessing evidence-based intervention. So you know a good intervention when you see one. You, have, you know why it's a good intervention. We're gonna look at the National Academy of Medicine's intervention spectrum, which tells you what is the, what is the, 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 the boundaries of what we should be concerned with. You know, uh, what are the different levels of intervention we should care about. Then I'm gonna show you a little bit about the Marine Corps' combat and occupation, our operational stress control program not because it's the best, um, it's been tested. Rand did a study. They could find no evidence that it was beneficial. I'm gonna go over evidence. Sharing it with you because it's the best, necessarily, because I can't prove that. But at least it meets the criteria I'm setting out here today. It's based on this comprehensive biopsychosocial spiritual understanding of trauma and it does everything that I'm going to tell you in the next hour that I think should be in a program. For PTSD and related disorders, burnout, uh, the evidence for their effectiveness, what works, what doesn't work. Uh, just quick uh, preview. Everything is about equally effective. Nothing works better than a little bit, and everything works a little. So that's the state of affairs we're in right now. So we have to accept that as reality. And then finally, I'm going to show you a tool from social work practice called, we call it moral mapping, and a social worker helped me develop this, uh, which is a way to assess sustaining attachments and how they've changed because of the trauma. So what makes an evidence-based intervention? 
SAMHSA, Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, published this really useful report in 2009 answering that question, identifying and selecting evidence-based interventions. And in the center of my slide, I have something I'm calling the evidence pyramid. Any and every intervention, whether it's for treatment, prevention, or anything, to really be evidence-based, to be able to take it to the bank, that intervention needs to meet all five of those criteria in that pyramid. Every intervention has to climb the pyramid, okay? And that's where most of our interventions have fallen down. And I'll share with you some of the uh, reports that have been done uh, documenting that. So what is this pyramid? It starts with a logic model. A logic model explains the relationship between the problem you're trying to fix and the intervention you want to use to fix it. What is the connection, right? So you cannot build, it may be true, for example, that prayer can relieve symptoms of PTSD, but if I can't explain how prayer can do that, and if I can't show evidence that prayer has been found effective in other similar things, then I cannot build a program about that and call it evidence-based, because even if I can find some evidence that it helped, if it doesn't make sense, it doesn't add to human knowledge. So, and the lack of logic models, particularly in prevention programs, particularly in the Army, was uh, severely criticized by an uh, Institute of Medicine report in 2014, uh, I think it's called Review of Prevention Programs for Psychological Disorders in the Military. And they, they included their review of the Marine Corps program I'm gonna show you. And they very rightly said, there's no evidence that any of these things work. But they said, at least the Marine Corps program has a logic model that makes sense, right? The Army's resilience model didn't make sense to them because they couldn't explain how teaching coping skills, for example, you're going to protect somebody from a psychological trauma, right? If, if a situation is overwhelming, how could you teach somebody to cope with something that's overwhelming? Because by definition, it's overwhelming. So logic model first. Then you have to do outcome studies. Publish them in peer-reviewed journals. Then when you get enough of those outcome studies, you do a meta-analysis. Like I showed you for risk factors, you compare outcome studies to see what is the experience, you know, overall, and then find, and then a board of experts convenes and delivers an expert consensus based on all these meta analyses. This is a good thing to do, and then finally improve on it. Don't just rest on your laurels. So that's what we're looking for. What interventions? or stress injuries and illnesses today meet those criteria? None, which is why we have to do this. Why you have to have this knowledge to be a smart shopper, to think critically about what people are telling you and help us all work toward this, right? Because that's what we need to do. That's where we need to be. So this, uh, on the right, I have, my own sort of description of how to build a logic model uh, based on the SAMHSA report. Number one, define the problem. What are its biopsychosocial spiritual determinants? And that's what we did this morning, right? Without that, we couldn't go to step two. Step two, find levers into the problem that we know work. What are the things we can pull or push or change, modify, that will change the outcome in some way? Then we have to measure, we have to implement the intervention, and we have to measure the outputs. Because otherwise, how do we know that it was actually delivered, right? Uh, if I give somebody a drug and they don't improve, I need to make sure they were taking the drug, right? So you need to measure outputs. And then finally, evaluate outcomes. How did it affect the problem? 
So that's, that's the first standard we need to keep in mind. Logic model is number one. Okay, and this is the second tool. This is uh, National Academy of Medicine, Institute of Medicine, has been developing this um, since 94, the first report on preventing psychological disorders in children. And they based it on Gordon's 1983 operational classification of disease prevention. And it's on the right, it's also called the protractor model, that you know, semi-circle, three levels of prevention, universal, selective, and indicated, then there's treatment, and then there's maintenance. So we're not gonna talk about maintenance, we're gonna talk a little about treatment, and a little about prevention. So these are the three levels of prevention. And each, according to this system, is defined solely by who it targets, which is way more useful than the old epidemiology, primary, secondary, tertiary prevention, because you don't know when you're talking to somebody or a group of people, a population. Some people have already been exposed. Some people are gonna be exposed, right? And you don't know who's who. This, this system is based solely on which group of people you're targeting. Universal targets all members of a population. It's called universal because that and because it doesn't require any expert help to deliver. So when you put on sunscreen before you go out in the sun, that's universal prevention. Teaching people to put on sunscreen before they go out in the sun, that's universal prevention. Everybody should do that, right? Uh, exercise, diet, all those things. During COVID, wearing a mask, social distancing, vaccination, those are all universal prevention. That's number one. And the nice thing about universal prevention is we've already done most of the work for constructing a prevention, universal prevention for stress injuries because the main thing that you do in universal prevention is you reduce risk factors and you enhance protective factors. So obviously you first need to figure out what those are. And we went through that this morning. So a universal prevention program for stress injuries is gonna reduce risk factors and enhance protective factors. Okay, the second one is selective prevention. And that is targeting a subgroup within the population a group of people who are at elevated risk for some reason. So for example, people who've all experienced a critical incident, a traumatic event together, uh, maybe a unit returning from a difficult deployment, that's a high risk group. So selective prevention is things that you do for that high risk group to mitigate their risk. It includes reducing risk and enhancing protective factors still, but it also adds screening and interventions to mitigate the distress that may already be experiencing. The quarantine, testing after exposure, selective prevention for COVID. And then finally, indicated prevention is sort of in between prevention and treatment in that it's intervening with a single person who's already having problems who's already symptomatic. And this is either preclinical, before they get to see a professional, or maybe their symptoms are mild enough or there's no mental health professional around. So maybe this is instead of clinical care. And in a lot of places, that's the case. But you know what? We already all know a lot about physical first aid, right? We know how to what to do if we get a cut or a bruise or a lot of different kinds of injuries and know how to how to decide do I need to go to the hospital or can I take care of this myself and what can I do to minimize damage while I'm waiting to get there that's first aid and that's what indicated prevention is and we're going to talk about that okay so those are the tools this is uh, an example of PTSD prevention interventions in the military today for universal selective and indicated prevention. So, but 
based on whether you conceive stress injuries to be literal harm to a person's identity because of an overwhelming traumatic experience, or whether you think it's maladaptive coping with fear. The maladaptive coping with fear model is the one that DSM criteria is based on, and a lot of first line interventions for, for prevention are based on. Okay, so these are universal prevention, resilience training, uh, Army's comprehensive soldier fitness. It's all about teaching a coping skill. Assuming that the reason these people are having problems is because they didn't have good coping skills at the time they were traumatized. There's no evidence for that. But that's the idea. Desensitization training to experiences of fear. And there's certainly evidence that that's helpful. Realistic, tough training before you go out there. So you're not blindsided. You're not, you're not as easily overwhelmed. Fitness program. Selective prevention for maladaptive coping. Psychological debriefing. Still widely used police and fire. Still used somewhat in the military, uh, army, some places in Europe. Uh, that is based on World War I battlefield psychiatry, which I'm going to describe to you next. Uh, it's based on the idea that it's not a real injury. If they thought it was a real injury, and they taught you CISD, and I've done that, I've done many, many, I've led three CISD teams. If they believed it was a real injury, they would include some kind of screening in the process, right? But instead, it's like, okay, we've done this hour and a half thing. Now you're cool. You're fine. Go home. You'll be fine, right? <laughs> well, and, and also, no interventions to do something with the people who didn't show up. And it's often the people who don't show up who most need it. So screening is actually avoided. I remember uh, hearing Charles Hogue, who is you know, one of the leading voices in Army psychiatry during most of the uh, OIF, OEF period. I remember hearing him at a VA conference. Uh, speaking to the undersecretary of the VA for healthcare about screening for TBI. And Charles Hogue was making the point that we should not screen for mild TBI, just like we shouldn't screen for PTSD. We shouldn't screen for PTSD because it's going to put the idea in people's heads. It's going to encourage malingering. And there's really nothing wrong with them anyway. So no harm. It's just shh, keep quiet about it. So screening was very much avoided. He actually said, do not screen. Now, indicated prevention, this, this has a horrible history, very sordid history. Uh, you probably all know World War I epidemic epidemics of shell shock, nerve and shock on the German Austrian side of the war, decimated uh, their ranks of soldiers, combatants, decimated the economies of the countries because they had to build all these new psychiatric hospitals and hire all these new providers and pay all this new disability compensation. And so 1916, after the worst fighting in the war, the Austrian uh, Society for Neurology and Psychiatry convened a conference in Munich. This is during the freaking war. And the purpose for the conference at which the leading psychiatrists and neurologists in the world attended, even though it's from the US and Britain and France, because Austria and Germany were the leaders of the profession. Freud was still alive. And the purpose of the conference was to take a vote whether it was possible for someone to acquire PTSD without a pre-existing vulnerability. And the particular pre-existing vulnerability that everyone was aware of through psychoanalytic thinking, whatever, is something called hysteria. Which is, you know, comes from 
Greek for womb. And to tell a man, there's a great book written about this call. I should have referenced it, about this whole situation. Calling a man a hysteric is intentionally stigmatizing. Uh, so they wanted to take a vote, and they were very clear about it. The government is encouraging us to take this vote. And by the way, anyone who's a scientist, science is not decided by votes. Okay? It doesn't work that way. So it was clearly to put a cap on this problem. And they did. They voted that you can only get PTSD if you had hysteria. And that allowed everybody on both sides of the war to treat this problem differently. And from that point on, the US and Britain, I don't know about France, used these principles that were devised by Thomas Salmon and a few other people in 1917. This is when this was published. And this is what I was still taught to do when I uh, was getting ready to deploy to Iraq. So PIES is one of the acronyms for this battlefield psychiatry. You know the one BICEPS? Simpler one, PIES, stands for proximity, immediacy, expectancy, and simplicity. Proximity means don't evacuate them. Keep them within the sound of the gun. Why? Because you don't want them to think they're going to go home. You also don't let them think they're a patient. Don't put them in a gown. Don't put them with other physical casualties, because that's not fair to the really injured people, right? So you keep them on the front lines, and you tell them you've got 72 hours. And the expectancy part is, and you will go back. And if you don't go back in 72 hours, it can only be because you have a pre-existing mental health problem. And really not much more treatment than three hots and a cot. So this is still doctrine in the US Army and a few other places, Britain. Go compare that to if you believe these are literal injuries, universal prevention, training to recognize an injury, right? If you want to know what to do about an ankle sprain, you've got to know what an ankle sprain is and how to know if you've got one, right? You want to strengthen the social and spiritual supports. It's all about your social support, spiritual support. Attack mental health stigma. We were talking, uh, I was talking to Brent a little while ago about uh, shame in the military and how military, I'm sure the police is similar, they use shame as a tool to modify behavior, to get you to do what they want you to do. But if you really want to get people help for a stress injury, you've got to attack that. You've got to say, no, no, it's not like that. It's just, it's just like a physical injury. If you broke your leg and you're trying to pretend I don't have a broken leg, that's not going to work. Selective prevention, screening number one. So if I am responsible for a group of people who, Marines, whatever, who experience some high risk event, first thing I want to do is figure out as best I can who's affected by it, in what way. Because they're not all, it's, you know, it's going to be some and not others. Just restore resources. So this is the whole thing about the stress balance, it's stressor load versus resources available to deal with. By resources, I mean time, I mean money, I mean access to important people in your life, you know, food, <laughs> everything that makes you restore. And then indicated prevention, stress first aid. Just like physical first aid, we need everyone in the world should know the basics of this, about how to recognize a stress injury, how to prevent it, how to mitigate it. Screening and restore resources. I hope you're wondering what stress first aid is. Okay. So this is uh, the Marine Corps' current 
Combat and Operational Stress Control Doctrine. It was first published in 2010. It was just re-released in 2017. Navy Marine Corps use it as, and it has informed many other organizational approaches to stress management. This is the background. This is an amazing story all by itself. Uh, when I when I was in Iraq, 04 and 05, I began teaching uh, Marine leaders and Marines and sailors and corpsmen and doctors about stress injuries and about the reasons to think they're literal injuries and about what to do about that, which had a kind of a two, a sort of a twofold effect, a sort of a double-edged sword. It was, it was helpful in many ways in that it made sense and it relieved some of the shame, made people feel it's not my fault, it's my brain, it's, I couldn't help it. Um, but it also made it very more difficult for the leaders because they were afraid, oh my God, I don't want my Marines coming to me tomorrow morning and saying, uh, sir, I can't fight today, I have a stress injury, right? They're worried about losing that, that lever, that shame lever, right? So they had, Marines had trouble with the term. Uh, but it wasn't a big deal until July of 2006, when I already transferred to headquarters Marine Corps, they created a billet for me there to develop the stress, the stress control program. And so they knew more stress injury stuff was coming. And in July of 2006, the Army revised its combat stress control doctrine. So it was a brand new publication, and they asked the Navy and the Marine Corps and the Air Force to join on and make it a, a joint doctrine. To my surprise, the Navy and Marine Corps agreed to non-concur. I told them I, I want no part of that because it was based on World War I pies and biceps. It was more of the same. And it had no room in there for stress injury. I said, this is not where we're going. So amazingly, both the Navy and the Marine Corps agreed. But that meant now we were on the hook to create our own doctrine. So the commanders of the three Marine Expeditionary Forces, three MEFs, one, two, and three MEF, which is all of the fighting forces of the Marine Corps, not a big service. Uh, Jim Mattis, Keith Stalder, Bob Neller, who I later served at the Pentagon when he was the Commandant, they said, we're going to create our own stress control program. You, Dr. Nash, are not going to do that. The Army's not going to do that. We're going to do it. And so this is the first time, as far as I know, still the only time, the three MEF commanders were very competitive, sibling rivalry. They hate each other, especially East Coast, West Coast. Uh, the only time they collaborated and all signed a single document together. This document addressed to the commandant said, we don't ever want to hear the stress injury term again. And we want to convene our own conference to create our own COF program, which then happened in Camp Pendleton, uh, 5th to 7th of September, led by line Marines, war fighters, officers enlisted. So there weren't very many mental health professionals. I was there to educate them, but they were in charge. And they came up with the tools I'm about to show you next. Uh, my job was to educate them, say, this, these are the facts. And they said, you know, I gotta tell you, uh, I have really very little reason to take any credit for that because all I did is stand my ground. But I think the um, biggest influence that helped the Marine Corps get over that hump, and then later the Navy, of you know, accepting this changing conception about PTSD, was the courageous Marines, particularly senior enlisted, who over the course of the war have come forward. Many, you know, uh, Silver Star winners, many Purple Heart winners, many, you know, uh, best possible Marines coming forward and say, I'm ruined. This is what's happened to me. And they could see that it wasn't because they were, they weren't maladaptive. They were great Marines. They were just damaged by these experiences. That was the thing that pushed them over the hump. 
amazingly, this conference ended the 7th of September. Five days later, these three generals signed another letter to the commandant and said, we want all Marines trained in the cost model using the stress continuum, which I'm going to show you now. And we want so many people trained in all these units. It's like, you know, total flip-flop. Not really, but. So this is, this is the current version of the uh, doctrine. And there's where you can reach it. So these two things in the center are the two tools that the Marine warfighters came up with, right? The first thing is the stress continual model, which is the basis for the whole operation. And it is just a tool for evaluating your own or someone else's stress level along four color-coded stress zones, ready, reacting, injured, and ill. And the key thing here, the most important thing for anyone to use this model is you've got to recognize when you cross this boundary between normal stress, transient distress that goes away with rest, and a stress injury that doesn't go away with rest. Right? That's the key, being able to recognize when that happens, and as a leader, not pushing your people to the point where they go beyond that capacity. So you don't push them into the orange zone. And if you start getting orange zone Marines from training, you're doing it too hard. And believe me, there's a lot of that. Uh, Sear School, Survival, Escape, Resistance, and Evasion. I have a lot of patients with PTSD from that training alone. So that was the first thing they did was a stress continuum model. Then they came up with this. They said, okay, this is clearly a leadership responsibility. And that's leaders of units, it's leaders of families, it's leaders of communities. And the leadership's job is these five functions. Strengthen, mitigate, identify, treat, and reintegrate. Strengthen needs enhanced protective factors, all the protective factors. Mitigate, reduce, reduce risk factors. Identify, recognize when somebody is in the orange zone and in need of stress first aid. Treat, apply for stress first aid and refer them for clinical care if that's indicated. And then finally reintegrate. That's help them get back to either being a, a Marine or help them move on with their lives and have a, a good transition. On the right is our model for what was originally called combat and operational stress first aid, and now is more often called the stress first aid. It's seven particular steps. I'm gonna go over with you a little bit more. The basics of the stress first aid we came up with at the conference in 2007, and then later, uh, yeah, there it is. In 2010, we manualized it, trained all the chaplains in the Navy, uh, many healthcare providers and how to do this. Uh, 2013, Navy Bureau of Medicine and Surgery modified it for caregiver occupational stress, which they called CGOC. 2015, it was modified by the National Fallen Firefighters Foundation for Firefighters. 2017, I think, police. Uh, and currently, since 2020, RAND and the VA National Center for PTSD have been collaborating on a randomized controlled trial of using stress first aid with healthcare workers affected by COVID and all the other challenges of being healthcare right now across the country. I don't know, Stanford is part of it. I don't know how many different uh, providers are part of this. They haven't reported the results yet, but it'd be very interesting to see. This lower reference here uh, to the National Center for PTSD's website on Stress First Aid, it's got a lot of useful links, a lot of downloadable content. Okay, so these are the seven C's of Stress First Aid. We were in the Navy, seven C's sounded like a good idea. 
is actually um, there are four of us that put put the most of this together. Brett Litz, Boston, uh, Patricia Watson with the National Center, uh, Richard Westfall with the Navy nurse captain uh, who came up with the seven seas idea, and me. Um, so, in, and they're broken up into three categories: continuous aid, stuff you should do all the time; primary aid to intervene for an acute stress problem; and then secondary aid, chronic stress. So, continuous aid, check and coordinate. Really, it's basically as simple as you got to know what's going on. You got to know your people, whether it's your family or your unit or your, your command, your work center, you got to know who's having trouble. Why? Because it's your responsibility. That is servant leadership, a term I heard here this morning, a great term. Coordinate who needs to know if somebody's having trouble. Not just to, you know, broadcast it, but, you know, are there people that need to know? And if we need help getting it. So those are two things that should be going on all the time. Checking, keeping track, coordinating. Then if somebody has an acute stress, primary aid, cover and calm. Cover, get to safety, right? Calm, reduce arousal, grounding, calm down. Then secondary aid is more getting back to baseline. And that's through connecting, meaningful social support, competence restoring function maybe through retraining uh, because very often excuse me the stress injury results in a loss of some some functional capacity and then finally confidence restoring self-esteem and hope based on better performance okay so that's the marine corps prevention program uh, this is, I want to take a few minutes talking about burnout. We had some great discussions uh, in the breakout this morning with Dan and Derek about uh, complex trauma and burnout and police. And they're very interwoven, very interconnected. They're both traumatic stress states. There is now ample evidence that Burnout is caused by moral distress, which has been researched in nursing going back to 1984, way before moral injury entered the, our conversation in the military. And there's now ample evidence moral distress is the root cause of burnout. What causes moral distress? This crap. Systemic. It's not individual, it's systemic. And the report on the right uh, from National Academy of Medicine, awesome report on burnout, taking action against burnout, a systems approach. Because this is from decades of industrial organizational psychology, safety, occupational health and safety, this emergence of this new model of safety called just culture. Clearly, problems occur most often because of systemic weaknesses, not because of individual weaknesses. So if you want to reduce burnout, you've got to attack these problems. And as uh, Derek said this morning, uh, if you work in the VA, you know about inefficient workflows, administrative burden, all this, degraded relationships. Healthcare is, is abysmal. <laughs> I can't believe how much today compared to 20, 30, 40 years ago. Doctors, their main, uh, what they're taught is that the thing that's going to get you in trouble is if your chart doesn't look good, right? If you don't check all the boxes you're supposed to check, you're going to get in trouble, right? It doesn't matter if you treated anybody or if you even listen. And most providers now, are like pounding on the computer while they say, yeah, yeah, I hear you, ha, 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 I hear you. But yeah, oh, it's just, it's not healthcare. So these are the things that affect burnout. So I wanna share this with you. 
I, I don't know how useful this is, but this is a uh, well-being training program for first-line providers. It's mostly for healthcare professionals, but it could be used by anybody. And I helped create this for UCLA. It's on their website. It's called ARMS. Uh, Assess, recover, mitigate, strengthen. It's really based on the Marine Corps COTS program, just kind of repurposed for clinician burnout. Four steps. Assess. Where am I right now with losing my controller? So where am I right now with current level of burnout, right? And there are many real easy scales to to assess your own, and the main dimensions of burnout are emotional exhaustion, uh, emotional numbing, uh, and losing joy in your work. So, and also assess your current risk and protective factors. And that's, okay, so we're gonna get back to that. So the next step is recover. It was really interesting to me to hear from Donald, uh, who policeman who's in the breakout this morning uh, about how one of the challenges for police officers who are experiencing burnout is they may literally be trapped in their job. So much more so than I'm familiar with in healthcare, where it's a little bit more easy to get reassigned, do something else. Because oftentimes the first thing you should think about doing if you're burned out is stop doing what you're doing. <laughs> Right? Cut that shit out. So that may mean getting transferred to another job. It may mean taking some extended leave if you can afford it. But there are many situations where that's not possible. But if you don't reduce your stress load or replenish your resources, you're just going to get more and more crispy by the day. Then in the final two, mitigate, strengthen, just like in the Marine Corps, reduce risk factors, enhance protective factors. An important part of this uh, training is encouraging people to figure out what their own personal risk and protective factors are. And and Donald, uh, what's Donald's last name? I feel bad. Pardon? Oh, is it David? David Leonard? Okay, so I'm really sure. David Leonard, I'm sorry. Uh, one of the things he talked about was someone asked a question of him about burnout, recovering from burnout. And uh, he, he gave a great answer. Uh, you got to return, and maybe it was there, you got to return to why did you go in this business in the first place, right? What, what, what joy does this give you? How does this make your life better? How does this make you feel better about yourself? How can I reclaim some of those joys, right? And that is uh, really the key piece of strengthen is to focus on what are the things that give you joy. That's what's gotten me to four years of the 400 patient load in West Los Angeles is every day I remind myself what is going to give me the most joy, therefore make me the best clinician. Nothing else matters. Right? So to me, that's also my best assessment for my own level of burnout on those days when I can't be there for my patients emotionally, because that's what gives me joy, to hear them, to see them open up and leave my office feeling less alone, right? Uh, so finding those things that give you joy and trying to get more of that key. So anyway, I encourage you to take a look at that. Okay, now we're going to talk about treatment of PTSD. On the left, I have the current DSM-5 criteria for PTSD, and in DSM-5, there's only one kind. There's a, they have a dissociative subtype, but really only cognitive dissociation. And it's pretty complicated. If you compare that to the World Health Organization's ICD-11 criteria right next to it, far simpler. So let me ask you this. Just looking at comparing those two diagnostic criteria sets, what do you think 
the impact is on a population's mental health of having much more complicated, restrictive diagnostic criteria, where you got to have at least two of these and two of these, and right? Because what happens if you only have one? You don't get a diagnosis. You don't get treatment. So what is the benefit of having a complicated diagnostic system? It limits access. It limits the number of people who get the diagnosis. Who does that benefit? Governments, insurance companies, period. So because of that, I pretty much ignore this in my clinical work, even though I'm supposed to diagnose by DSM-5 criteria, but here's, here's the catch-22, the, the way I get away with it. ICD-11 is the international insurance standard. So I don't get paid for delivering care unless I make an ICD-11 diagnosis, not a DSM diagnosis. So I, I work with the ICD-11. The other reason I much prefer this system is because ICD-11 now has the diagnosis of complex PTSD, which DSM-5 still does not acknowledge the existence of. And that's the same first four criteria set sets and adds to that affect dysregulation, painful sweating at the podium when you're giving a talk, low self-worth because of sweating during the talk, and relationship failures. All right. This difference in conception makes a huge, huge difference in treatment because where I work, it's Los Angeles, Southern California, for sure, is a very cognitive behaviorally oriented treatment system. If they have somebody that has all this affect dysregulation and impulsivity, emotional pain, and also has cardinal symptoms of PTSD, they say, ah, you have PTSD and a personality disorder or PTSD and bipolar disorder. It's like, if you don't acknowledge the existence of complex PTSD, then where else are you gonna put anger? People whose main problem is anger, they often get here or there, right? And, and that's totally unfair because if you use this system, it's one disorder. And you can, you can verify this by getting the history, right? When did you start having these problems with anger? Well, it was after I was raped in boot camp. Okay, well then that's part of complex PTSD. So I just wanna review some of the consequences PTSD, why this is such an insidious disease. On the left, I have what the common physical comorbidities are for uh, chronic PTSD. Accelerated aging, early death, arthritis, sleep apnea, substance abuse, psychosis. I have, 30, I have veterans in their 30s and 40s who have all the old man diseases because of this accelerated aging because of allostatic load, because of complex PTSD. There are also social consequences, divorce, family ruptures, unemployment, homelessness, incarceration. The Department of Justice did a study a few years ago <laughs> comparing inmates of prisons in the U.S. who were veterans versus non-veterans. One of the main differences they found is veterans were most likely incarcerated for a single incident of impulsive aggression. They lost their temper and did something stupid, as opposed to selling drugs or robbery or something like that. Family and community consequences. This is, you know, secondary vicarious trauma, very complicated system, but family violence, uh, other stress-related problems, substance abuse, crime, so communities in which many people have been traumatized have all these community complex PTSD. Okay, so now I'm going to review the commonly used treatment approaches for PTSD. 
based on the symptoms that they uh, address. Starting at 1.30 with uh, emotional experience, animal assisted therapy. That is, a, I think they are amazing gift, right? In terms of being able to experience love and joy again, right? When your world is contracted to this little burned out cinder. Awesome, because we know they love us. Uh, art, activity therapy, mindfulness. This is a great tool, I think, for tolerating painful affect. And I like the ACT approach, acceptance and commitment therapy, which is really just mindfully allowing yourself to feel the emotions, let them wash over you. Don't make them go away. Remind yourself that it's just a signal, like a fire detector that's going off. It may mean there's a fire or it could mean something else. It could be a bad battery, right? Just let it wash over you. Don't do anything about it because you know every time this happens, it goes away eventually. And then figure out, what does this mean about me and my life? Do I need to change anything? And if not, just let it go. Relationships. Uh, this is a place where peer therapy, so a uh, big push for in VA for uh, peer support specialists. When it works, it works great. When it doesn't, it doesn't. Uh, group and family therapies, retreats, immersive experiences to reestablish trust. To feel again like you're worthy of someone to see. And then concept of the world, cognitive reprocessing, obviously it's one. Uh, to me, the only real money maker here is seeking and making amends. Because here's, here's the situation. If I feel like I am not a good person because of things that I've experienced, things that I've done that I'm not proud of, I can't make that go away. That's on my resume forever, right? My real resume. So what can I do about that? How can I feel better about myself? Well, I have to do goodness. I have to plant a flag of goodness in the ground and work at that until I feel like I have created enough goodness that I can be forgiven for what I did that wasn't so good. Making, seeking amends, make the world a better place. Connection to the transcendent, obviously that's a place for spiritual counseling, connection. Uh, I was part of an awesome article written about the role of chaplains in moral injury. Uh, you Google that, you'll be able to find it, super. Uh, authority over oneself. This is the domain that needs the most urgent treatment because nothing else will get better if a person is having panic attacks or rage outbursts or dissociative flashbacks or not sleeping or any of those things. So this is a place where serotonin enhancing antidepressants can be very helpful. Now, a lot of people don't understand serotonin and I barely understand it myself, but the thing that's helped me figure it out is looking at the history of how we became aware of the role of serotonin in stress. One of the early studies was a study done by a Navy psychiatrist in San Diego right at the end of World War II. They had all these sailors and Marines back from the war in Pacific in Oceanside, San Diego. And you know what they were doing. They were drinking, they were getting arrested, they were getting in fights, they were tearing the place up. So the psychiatrist did a study where he did spinal taps on a bunch of these sailors and Marines and measured the level of serotonin in the spinal fluid. And what he found was there's an inverse relationship between the serotonin level and the violence level, the discontrol level. Another study is with fish, now, you know, they're vertebrates, they have the same system, and they figured out a way chemically to ablate the serotonin system. So there's no serotonin function whatsoever in these fish, little fish. They put these little fish back in the tank and they acted normal. They swam around, they ate, they pooped, until someone put a big fish in there, a predator fish. Then those little fish would kill themselves, rocketing back and forth across the glass because they couldn't contain that 
they had no resistance to that alarm. So serotonin is all about authority over yourself. So anyone who has any of these symptoms, anger, anxiety, or depression, absolutely should make every attempt to tolerate the serotonin enhancing antidepressants. Because that can make a world of difference. I tell my patients, the way you're going to know this works is you're going to one day, hopefully soon, you'll do something, you'll go somewhere, and you'll experience something that in the past would have triggered you, and you go, whoa, that wasn't so bad. And that's what that medicine can do. It's also a place for anti-adrenaline drugs like praesocin for nightmares, sleep drugs, mood stabilizers I'm not so sure about. I'm mostly keen on serotonin, but you've got to get good sleep, you've got to calm down, you've got to put the fire out. This is a fire. And then finally, continuity over time. Uh, this, is, this is a great place for journaling, biography, writing a book, uh, as David did. So, okay, so how do these work? How well do they work? These are two reviews from JAMA. First one is 2015, the other one is 2020. Uh, colleagues of mine, Maria Steenkamp, Brett Litz, Cheryl Pogue, Charlie Marmer at NYU. The one on the left is a meta-analysis of 36 randomized controlled trials of treatments for PTSD using all methodology. Of the 36, five were of CPT, four were of PE, and the rest were the other 27 were something else. These were all military, veterans, but mostly sexual trauma, almost no combat. So to me, that alone right there is like, all right, so in 2008, the VA and DOD made PE and CPT mandatory first-line treatments for PTSD. And as of 2015, seven years later, there was still not a single randomized controlled trial of either treatment in combat veterans. Yet this is still the mandatory treatment for veterans and military with PTSD. So at this point, there was no RCT of military PTSD. But they compared these for the MST. And of the nine PE and CPT studies, 27% dropped out, uh, 60 to 72% retain their PTSD diagnosis. So only, what is that? 28 to 30% or 18 to 30, 40, 40 to 28 to 40. Got better enough, they no longer be diagnosed with PTSD. And between group effect sizes, so if you compare the PE CPTs to the everything else, if anything, the other treatments did a little bit better a little bit higher effect size. And that's without even factoring in this huge dropout rate. 2008, the same year, VA and DOD made those treatments mandatory. The Institute of Medicine published a report. They were asked to review the evidence of PE and CPT and military combat PTSD. And what they concluded was it was impossible. It would be impossible to ever conclude that prolonged exposure is effective for the treatment of PTSD as long as the dropout rate is so high. The reason is you only need a little bit of worsening in those who drop out to wipe out the gains in those who stay. They don't follow up with the ones who drop out. They don't know how much worse they got. So at this point, everything works a little bit and these effect sizes so, you know, Cohen's D is a, this is a measure of how much the mean level of distress moved after treatment. And an effect size of 1.0 means it moved exactly one standard deviation, which is really not very far. So, uh, and that's in the whole group. And this is mostly less than one. A, a fifth or a quarter of an effect size of a standard deviation. A very small, very small gain. 
So 2020, the follow-up report reported on the first randomized controlled trial of these treatments, PE the and CPT in combat veterans in Texas, Fort Hood, the Strong Star Consortium, big international a group with the top people doing it. And what they found, uh, they did many different comparisons. 746 soldiers with combat PTSD, 31% recovered or improved. No differences in outcomes were found between PE, CPT, transcendental meditation, sertraline, or placebo. They are all equally effective, equally ineffective. Dropout rates up to 48%. You can't say that works. I, I, you know, if I was, as a healthcare professional, if half of my patients left at the first session and said, I don't know what you're selling, but I'm not buying it. You know? So everything works a little bit. Nothing works in a population more than that. So it's got to be all about matching treatments to individuals. Okay, so what can we do to target moral injury in particular? Now we're winding down to the end, so we'll have some time to talk. This is by uh, moral engine model, the same thing we saw before, just to remind ourselves of what the problem is, the loss of these sustaining attachments internally or externally. And these are this is what I do. This is how I treat this problem. It's not easy, uh, but at least it's genuine. Number one, become a reliable, temporary valuing attachment for your patient or client. You know that's what they want, right? If you have just been devastated by a trauma that has you know, uh, somehow wiped out some of your sustaining attachments and you're feeling alone, and isolated and bad about yourself. You know, just some empathic caring, letting the person know that you, that they matter to you. It's huge. I've never had anybody say that wasn't enough. You know, and many of them, I only give them 20 minutes a session, one session a month, and they know how to use that 20 minutes to get value. And I make sure they know I value them. That's a hard thing to do with patient after patient, day after day. We're much happier doing technique things because it's impersonal. We don't have to engage. To really value somebody, you have to listen and you have to really care and communicate that caring. They know if you're blowing smoke. That's number one. Be that. What does that do? That primes the pump. Right? The moral engine is slowed down because of the loss of those sustaining attachments. So you get in there and you prime that pump, you get it going again. And if it works, which it, you know, I've never seen it not work, what then the person does is they then have the capacity to go out and develop and establish new sustaining attachments, new things and people to fall in love with. And that's what's going to carry you forward. But they can't do that if the engine is stopped. Then authority over self-domain, like I said, that's crucial to get that under control because none of the healing is not going to happen otherwise. Then third, assess current and former sustaining attachment internal and external. Try to get a sense of how did this trauma change the sustaining attachment you'll have access to. And then finally, repair or replace those damaged or lost attachments. All right, how can you do that? This is not an easy thing to do. Uh, and I never actually sit down with a patient and ask them to draw it out longhand because as you're going to see here in a minute, this is very personal stuff. So if I ask you, lay out here for me every person and thing you're in love with. Who and what frosts your cake? And be honest, right? That would be, you know, it's very difficult because we all have things that we're into that we don't really want other people to know about necessarily. That's okay. So it's just hard to do on in an interpersonal basis, but teaching people the tool 
hey, use this on your own. Think about it. Or I might at times recognize something that clearly has changed in terms of sustaining tax and draw their attention to it. The important thing is to see how this process works. So the four domains of the four quadrants of sustaining attachment, external human, external non-human, internal human, internal non-human. So this is my own moral map that I drew just before I came here. Slightly sanitized, I left out some of the kinkier stuff. So external human, uh, siblings, I have uh, three sisters, two brothers. If I were doing this for real, each one would have to have their own. By the way, the way I've drawn these arrows, this is from a social work tool called uh, eco mapping and I've adapted it a little bit. Uh, so a bidirectional arrow is both valued and valuing. One direction arrow is either valued or valuing. So this is a valued attachment to heroes. They don't value me because they don't even know I exist. Right? This is one directional. Two directional and a dotted line means that it's not a solid attachment there's some difficulties there like with my four sons some more than others co-workers i have a personal trainer i've been working for four years she's awesome external non-human i love nature sailing can't wait to buy my house in the woods in connecticut i love the woods I love my home, but it's also it's in Los Angeles, you know, it's so that's a dotted line just because of that. I love food. I didn't say sustaining attachments were all good for you. Uh, I love America, but that's gotten to be a dotted line for me as well. Uh, justice. The external non-human institution of justice. So then internal non-human i love what i have learned to do in my life and i love the good that i have done because of it right this is what sustains me through a hell of a lot my internal values what matters to me which is different from what's out in the world and music gets me through all kinds of crap internal humans my parents who i've internalized dotted line is all they get my heroes are more solid, my therapist years ago, many years, and a teacher I had when I was in grammar school who really saved my life. Okay, so this is more or less my current sustaining attachments in all four domains. So which of these might be harmed by a moral betrayal? Let me make it more specific. What if I make a really bad mistake in my care of a patient? Maybe because I was feeling sick or burned out and overwhelmed, distracted, didn't do a good job, I didn't do everything I should have done, and the patient died. Did that affect any of these relationships? Which one? What's that? Co-worker. Right. So, right. So they might hear about it and have less respect for me, value me less. Correct. Right. With my siblings, I wouldn't tell them about it for fear they would think less of me. Right. Would I feel like I let down my parents or my heroes or my therapist? Maybe. I certainly would take a hit here in my skills and accomplishments, right? And I got a big booger on me. What if instead of am I self, where I did something, what if someone did something to me? What if one of my coworkers assaulted me? How would that change things? Clearly, coworkers gonna take a huge hit it would be a long time before I get close to another coworker, right? And, and many other things as well. So that's the idea. You have to figure out 
you know, and when you sit down with somebody and ask them to go through, how is your life different now because of what happened? You realize all these relationships are affected because you're afraid they're going to learn about it. You're trying to keep them from seeing the symptoms because you're ashamed of it. Okay, so if that's the problem, how do you fix that? What could I do about these things? That's not, there's no like pat answer to that question. But the bottom line for me is you got to look at where the loss was and what can you do to either shore it up or replace it. So clearly, if it's um, I did something wrong in my care of a patient and I don't feel good about myself as a clinician anymore, maybe I would do some extra training or, or go on a speaking tour talking about having a patient suicide or write a book about it or something to right the wrong in some way, right? To, to regain some of my trust in these things. If it's someone outside of me that's done the harm, that's a lot tougher. A lot tougher. Uh, woman, I think she wrote a book called Moral Repair from the perspective of a rape survivor, saying very clearly, if you've been trumped, if you've been assaulted by someone else, and they're not coming forward to apologize or make up for it, the ball's in your court. There's nothing. You're, you're powerless, basically. So that's the bottom line. And anything that you can't shore up, repair, replace. So what else can you get to fill these holes? One of my marine patients who was a almost severe uh, major depression, along with PTSD that I treated at Los Angeles, who's a infantrymen in the Marine Corps, and he was a star Marine. Everyone, he was like the guy that could do anything. He was revered in his unit as the top dog. He was the alpha male. He gets out of the Marine Corps. He's got nothing. He's lost all his sustaining attachments. By the way, that's why getting out of the military is so traumatic for so many people. Because if you look at what, were your, what was your moral map, while in uniform, and then what's your moral map as a civilian? Holy crap, what a difference, right? Everything that used to make your life meaningful is gone now. So when I showed him the moral, uh, the moral engine model, he said, wow, that I have never had a valued external human attachment, never. He said, I was always my own valued attachment. Obviously, that's the core problem of narcissism because he didn't have anybody. But at least now we know what the problem is. And that was a year and a half ago, and now he's doing great because he just sort of like figured out, okay, I need to fix that. Okay, so just one more time to look at that. And I'm open for questions and comments. If you guys have a question, if you could raise your hand, we'll run a microphone to you so that Dr. Nash can hear you and our audience members online can hear the questions as well. I'm curious about your opinion on EMDR in the context of treating PTSD. EMDR. Uh, it's gotten a bad rap in uh, the U.S. Uh, cognitive psychology community, mainly because they don't understand it. I don't understand it either. I don't know why it works, but I believe it works, and that's all that matters to me. I also think what I, I've never done it. What I know about EMDR, it's a lot more individual specific and a lot less, you know, rote, manualized. You do these twelve things and. You know, so, but I know the data is good, so I'm cool with that. And and also many of the practitioners that I've known over the years who do NDR are people with deep compassion. To me, that's like okay. You go.
I was just wondering how much you know that the disability that people are getting is a problem for success. The disability compensation? Yeah, you, you can see some success in people that you work with. Right. But if they mean they think they're going to lose their disability, right. that they're getting poor PTSD, it's a, it's a tough one to know. It's a very twisted, sick system. You're right. It is set up for failure. And I think in at least two ways. And one you mentioned is that, you know, once you are awarded disability, you have to prove that you still deserve it. So, you know, I have patients who come in just to get a note put in their chart, right? Uh, that's terrible. I, uh, what I, what I'm proposing to the United Nations and others is that, you know, clearly the damage from complex trauma is never undone. Even, even though the, the long arc of it is gradual improvement over time, you can never regain all the loss. You can never catch up again. So once a person ha is diagnosed as disabled, permanently disabled, they should get it for life. You shouldn't have to stay sick to warrant it because that's baloney. Even if your symptoms went away, okay, you're no longer symptomatic, but you're living in a homeless shelter, you got no family, no job. Right? So that's number one. Number two is, and this is why I personally never applied for, one reason I never applied for disability compensation myself, my trauma is mostly early life. So the Marine Corps didn't hurt me. The Navy didn't hurt me that bad. But the other reason is you kind of, sometimes you have to live up to that disabled label. I didn't want to take on that identity of being a disabled veteran. Right? I didn't want that as one of my social identities because there's a certain, you know, and I see it all the time of once you start sliding down that slope where you get more and more and more disabled and, you know, your wife can't put up with it anymore so she leaves, you know, so it's a terrible system. We have one question from our online audience. We have someone who's wondering if you could address adaptive disclosure and how you use this technique. Adaptive disclosure is a manualized, mostly cognitive behavioral treatment for loss and moral injury, mostly created by Brett Litz, one of my longtime colleagues and good friends. Um, it is, it is, it differs from PE and CPT in that it has a strong element of military culture in it, so that people can understand the culture in which these things happen. There's also a strong uh, emphasis on uh, making amends, to seek, or to give forgiveness. There's a little bit of Buddhism in there, and um, it's still being tested. Uh, it's on its second or third trial. Uh, I don't use it much because it's kind of manualized. And manualized treatments, that's another uh, distortion. Uh, so a manualized treatment means, so I've got this manual that says you do these 12 steps, and here are the words you should speak as you're doing each, right? So I'm reading from the manual while I'm treating you. Oh my God. I can't do that. Uh, but it also means you can't individualize it in any way. And the reason they do that is because of the belief that you can't conclude that the treatment is effective unless you can prove that it was done consistently, right? Patient to patient to patient. So that's manualized. So you can say everybody's saying the same words. And that is just to gain the evidence base. Despite the fact that's a horrible treatment if you're reading from a guide, right? I, I'd walk out of the office if you did that to me. So uh, I don't know if that answers your question. <laughs> oh, that was online.
not in veteran communities where I typically work because that's not part of their life experience. But I totally get how, you know, if the system is squeezing you economically in one way, you know, your inner shark says, I got to survive first and foremost, even if I have to lie, right? I've got to put food on the table. And so I can totally understand how that would distort everyone's uh, approach and use of the mental health system, their approach to disability compensation. And, and attitudes people have about disability compensation are so uh, extreme in many cases. You know, there are people who are stomping their feet saying, God damn it, I deserve this. This is my right. You know, and there's something to that. And then at the same time, there are other people stomping their feet and saying, you know, how dare you take my tax dollars to buy your marijuana, you know, whatever. So the, 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 the economics of this whole mess, a huge distortion. And if somehow the economics could be removed from the equation, it would be so much easier to treat. Um, yeah, so a uh, two part question. So um, one, um, are the physical effects of stress um, long, long lasting? I know like this, I read that book, The Body Keeps Score, and I was concerned about that. Because I used to be a VA supervisor, I also work at the VA. Um, and I used to get uh, migraines, weekly migraines from managing MFA. Um, so I don't do that anymore. But <laughs> <laughs> no surprise to me. <laughs> and then and then a second uh, question is um i think some uh, veterans i'm a combat vet and i think i have a little bit of imposter syndrome when it comes to ptsd like i'm not you know i'm not like a vietnam vet so i i can't have ptsd i'm not worthy to have that kind of a oh 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 so that is another thing about the va that just makes me furious this uh hierarchy of care, that somehow combat veterans should get service before non-combat veterans and, you know, blah, blah, blah. Uh, that is just awful. Uh, and the system is set up that way, and it's really, it's all about discouraging care. It's all about discouraging people from coming forward, finding reasons to limit access. Uh, there is no scientific reason to think that people who were traumatized by a combat experience should be treated with any less compassion than someone whose PTSD is from a rape, military sexual trauma, or any of the other, you know, billions of things that can cause trauma. It's the same freaking disease. But you're right, the system has these tiers, these hierarchies of, you know, and if, you, or if you're not a combat veteran, and of course, Part of the way the combat veterans maintain their self-esteem sometimes is, you know, oh, listen to him, he's blowing smoke, you know, he's pretending he was in combat, but he never, you know. But, so it's, it's rampant and it definitely interferes with care. And it doesn't make any sense. I mean, it's stigma. Stigma. There was, um, there should have been a watershed in the U.S in mental health care in the military in 2007, because that was the year that um, the Washington Post published a series of articles about the horrible care of soldiers with PTSD at Walter Reed, uh, the Walter Reed debacle. And that generated this huge effort by DOD and VA to assess the problem, mental health, the mental health task force, I think they were called. They visited dozens of VA and military sites and wrote this huge report, detailed all of the problems in the military mental health system. And the number one problem is that you are never going to fix this problem if you don't do something about stigma. What has the military done about stigma? If you read the in theater mental health, I think they're MHATs, mental health advisory teams, I think. So from 2003, because of the spike in suicides in theater, all the way until about 2012 or 2013, so almost 10 years, 
every year the army sent a team of researchers to Iraq and Afghanistan to survey soldiers and in some case Marines about their current mental health symptoms and every year they find you know 15 20 percent have diagnosable PTSD or major depression or generalized anxiety huge numbers and every year they ask the same set of stigma questions about how comfortable are you telling anyone about these problems uh, and why wouldn't you and the same answers every year no change i wouldn't tell anyone because they would blame me for it they wouldn't trust me anymore i would be punished and i haven't seen any genuine effort by dod to do anything about that and i think it's because there's still this idea that this is maladaptive coping and so what we want is to hold their feet to the fire push them harder Are we good? All right, thank you so much, guys. Thank you, Dr. Nash, for such great presentations on your work in combat and occupational threats injuries. We are so grateful to have the opportunity to host you here at Grand Valley and learn more about this important topic. The afternoon breakouts are scheduled to begin at 3.15. For those joining us online, please don't forget to switch to the breakout link, which is included in the email. We will release for the day directly from the breakout session. You will be receiving an end of survey or end of conference survey. Please complete the survey and share your thoughts as will be helpful in planning for future conferences. And also this survey is required for those wishing to receive the social work CEUs. On behalf of the Hallenstein Center staff, the Hidden Means of War Conference Planning Committee and our partners, Grand Valley's Peter F. Secchia Military and Veterans Resource Center, the West Michigan Veterans Coalition, and Kent County Veterans Service Office, thank you for attending the 2022 Hidden Means of War Conference and